Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thank you so much for being here. While you're getting logged in, go ahead in the chat box and write your name and where you are logging in from tonight. And if your little blue button is set to hosts and panelists, go ahead and switch that to everyone. Looks like everybody is on everyone, which is great. Um, but if you are defaulted to hosts and panelists, go ahead and change that to everyone so we can say hello. So I see lots of Michigan folks, lots of Florida folks. Who have I missed? North Carolina. More Michigan, yay, epic. West Virginia. Where else? Florida, Florida. Lots of Florida people. Hello, leaders. More Michigan. Hello, Detroit. Lots of epic and lead participants here tonight. Thank you for being with us. I know we're getting close to spring break and teacher tired is in full swing. Oh no, it's back to cold, Lauren. It was very hot here today. <laughs> it's very hot. I think we might be done with winter. I don't, I don't know. I'm not ready for winter to be done yet though. Our temperature up here in New York is dropping like a stone tonight. So we had like nice 55, 60 degree weather today. I shouldn't say nice because it was, you know, rainy, but uh, then it's going to be like in the teens tomorrow. So. so Richard is asking where in New York? Richard is also a native New Yorker. Yeah, I live uh, just south of Newburgh, which is in the Hudson Valley. So about 60 miles north of New York City on the west side of the Hudson. It's a very nice area of the country. <laughs> it is. It's beautiful. I'm originally from North Dakota, so I'm a transplant, but I've been out here since 2009. So I think I've officially adopted some New Yorker tendencies. All right. Well, fantastic. I have right at 730. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. So welcome on behalf of Project LEAD, uh, which is brought to you from a grant from the DOE. And we also have a lot of our epic friends in Michigan joining us. So welcome and welcome to everyone from wherever you are joining. Uh, thank you for being here for our food history webinar. And we hope to see some of you at our annual conference in Cleveland next week. So we are looking forward to that. Just some upcoming webinars that we have. We have the history of American slavery with Deirdre Cooper Owens from the University of Connecticut on March 14th. On April 2nd, we have Indians, settlers and slaves in the age of Jackson with Christina Snyder from Penn State University. And then coming up on April 3rd, navigating transatlantic networks, insights into human history with Jorge Felipe Gonzalez from the University of Texas, San Antonio. And we have some other ones, but those will be a lot later. Uh, my colleague Kathleen has dropped the link to that in the chat if you wanna check out some of our other upcoming webinars. Um, but I am gonna go ahead and welcome our speaker for tonight. Sarah Warsberg Johnson is the food historian and I'm sure some of you follow her blog and her website online. She is an author, speaker, educator, podcaster, and blogger on all things related to food history. She's a frequent interviewee by journalists looking for historical content and was featured on the History Channel's The Food That Built America. So you can check that out. She's been featured on NPR, The Atlantic, CNN, um, and many, many more publications. She's published with the New York History Journal and the Agricultural History Journal. And she's working on her book, Preserver Parish Food in New York State during the Great War, 1916 through 1919. So quite accomplished. Uh, and although she works full time as a museum professional, her lifelong love is for food history. We talked a little bit about that before everyone hopped on. 
Her areas of specialty include rural and agricultural education, uh, women's history, the history of domestic science, World War I, World War II, homefront history, the progressive era, which we'll be talking about tonight, and the country life movement in the history of food in general. So welcome, Sarah. We're thrilled to have you here. Thanks for having me. And hello, everybody. I'm loving seeing all of your um, little check-ins from where we are. I know some of you are familiar with the Hudson Valley, uh, which is where I currently live. And some people said they're familiar with Fargo, North Dakota, which is where I'm originally from. Um, so it's great to see you all. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully this will work the way I want it to. Let's see. Trying to do two screens. Okay. Now let me ask, can you guys see <laughs> my screen or uh my notes side? Okay, screen. Great. Because I have uh two screens here, so it's always a little bit of a juggle. So tonight's talk is all about um food during the progressive era and immigrant food ways in particular. So the title is, what I came up with was Melting Pot, Immigrant Food Ways, the Progressive Era and the Development of American Food. I am very interested in kind of the hows and whys of American food more generally. And the progressive era really has a big impact on how we eat, and why we eat the things we do. And part of that has to do with immigration. So let me see if it'll let me click through here. Yep. So what do you think of when you hear the phrase melting pot? Is it probably one of these? Um, the idea of a melting pot comes from metal smelting, which is this idea that disparate parts of metal can be melted down to make a single whole, right? And many people argue that the United States is more of a mosaic than a melting pot, and that the smelting metaphor more generally implies the erasure of certain characteristics, right? And given that the history of American attitudes toward immigration, uh, I think that argument has some merit. Uh, I would argue, however, that at least when it comes to food, the smelting metaphor is more apt, um, because in metallurgy, alloys are often better than the sum of their parts. Right. And since I'm a food historian, I have to have a food analogy. So the same thing goes for stew, right? Plain beef and water with no seasoning is not particularly palatable. But if you add vegetables, grains, spices, you end up with something delicious, right? Something where each part is still whole, but it makes up something greater than the sum of its parts. So that's what I think of when I think of a melting pot and American history uh, and immigration. And we'll come back to the melting pot metaphor um, several times during this talk, so just keep that in mind. So <clears throat> today we're gonna talk about immigrant foodways in America with an emphasis on the progressive era, right? So this image um, is from the dawn of the progressive era, right, 1889. Uh, and it's, um, sorry, it's, uh, it's progressive era has kind of a complicated relationship with immigration, right? And this, this political cartoon from Puck Magazine kind of brings that home. So we have Columbia, who is representative of America. Uh, she's stirring a bowl called citizenship with a spoon labeled equal rights. And in the bowl, a whole host of people from all over the world appear to just, you know, rest comfortably, except for one who is brandishing a bloody knife and a green flag. And his sash reads, Irishman. And in the mortar of assimilation, he is the one element that won't mix. Right? So when we talk about immigration, we talk about America, we often are talking about assimilation, and there's a lot of anti-Irish and anti-immigrant rhetoric that's coming out at this time, but there's also a lot of recognition that immigration makes up a big part of the American population. 
Um, so I thought that given the context of immigration in the progressive era is kind of complicated, that we would take a look at the history of immigration, right? So we're all kind of on the same page. Um, there are four main reasons for immigration. First, we have overpopulation, particularly overpopulation in Europe. Uh, we have religious persecution. We have economic hardship or lack of opportunity. And we have forced removal, which in this country typically means uh, Africans who are enslaved. So in the 17th century, most immigrants to the New World are fleeing to escape religious persecution. So we have Protestants like Huguenots, Walloons, Separatists, who are also known as the Puritans, Moravians, um, they all found relief from persecution in this time period, as did Jews fleeing the Spanish Inquisition, especially in Dutch-held colonies like New Netherland, which today is New York. Um, and immigrants from Europe also came for economic opportunity and to alleviate that overpopulation, right? In Europe, the bulk of land was held by an aristocratic few. Um, and others are forced to immigrate, right? particularly enslaved Africans who were in bondage in all of the original 13 colonies until the American Revolution and in many colonies, including in the North, uh, until the Civil War. Um, in the 19th century, our immigration patterns start to shift. You get Irish immigrants escaping colonization and the potato famine. You get Ashkenazic Jews escaping pogroms and other religious minorities like Germans from Russia, Amish, and Mennonite communities escaping religious persecution. And by the end of the 19th century, you have Scandinavians, Eastern Europeans, Italians, Greeks, Middle Easterners, and Chinese communities escaping economic hardship. So we're gonna do some immigration timeline uh, and talk about immigration legislation in the United States. So, for the first, you know, almost 200 years, immigration to the quote unquote new world is largely unfettered, right? If you can afford to get there, you can come. There's no real restrictions on your entry into the country. You don't need a visa. You don't need any paperwork. You just show up at a port. Ta-da, you are now a resident. Um, in 1790, uh, one of the first tasks of our brand new government was to pass the Naturalization Act, which allowed only white immigrants who had resided in the US for at least two years and any children under 21 to gain citizenship. So you had to have lived in the United States for at least two years. You had to be white in order to be a citizen, right? Um, so this ex specifically excluded non-white people from becoming citizens, targeting in particular indigenous people and enslaved and free Africans. Um, around the same time, we get the Alien Friends Act, uh, Alien Friends and Enemies Act, sorry. It's two separate acts, um, which gave the US president the power to deport anyone, any non-citizen that he deemed dangerous, even if they were from an allied nation, and the right to deport all residents who are citizens of any nation the United States is at war with. Um, the U.S. is relatively quiet on immigration through the first half of the 19th century. Most people could still enter the U.S. through any port without much government interference. And in 1855, um, New York's Castle Garden, which is a former military fort, was transformed into an entry port. Uh, and then in the midst of the Civil War, the U.S. passed the Immigration Act of 1864, which essentially made indentured servitude a thing again. Um, we hadn't really had much indentured servitude since the 1820s. This Immigration Act kind of revives it. It allows businesses to contract with workers overseas and then require them, once they import them into the United States, to work off their debts. Uh, it was very unpopular with labor organizers, um, so much so that that law was actually repealed in 1868. Here we have a few images that uh, we associate generally with Castle Garden. So like I said, it started as a military fortification. It's located on, on the tip of lower Manhattan. Um, but by the mid 19th century, it becomes sort of like a pleasure garden. Uh, and so when it's transformed into a point of entry for immigration, it led to some kind of tugging kink 
cartoon. So this is a labor exchange. This is a more serious sketch. Um, basically, people show up outside Castle Garden and it's kind of like a hiring fair, right? If you're looking for day laborers, if you're looking for servants, you can go there and hire people. This one's a little more tongue in cheek. Um, this one is called A Day at Castle Garden, which kind of implies like a leisure day trip. But instead, we have some German immigrants. And they're saying, das muss der Palace sein, uh, which means this must be, that must be the palace, right? So it's kind of poking fun at these fresh off the boat German immigrants uh, coming from monarchies, right? And aristocracies so that are coming to the United States. They don't realize that it's a democracy without a landed aristocracy, right? At least not an official one. Um, Post-war, the U.S. passes a whole host of le legislation, including the Naturalization Act of 1870, which allowed people of African descent uh, to become naturalized citizens. So basically all former slaves and free people of color officially become American citizens. And this is a really important part of Reconstruction. Uh, and so I found this amazing image, which is the statue of the freed slave in Memorial Hall. It's from the Philadelphia Centennial um, Exposition. And I, I thought this is a great one because there aren't a lot of period illustrations that showcase um, people of African descent uh, in middle and upper class clothing, right? A lot of the illustrations and images from the period are of people who are formerly enslaved or, or people who are enslaved, right? Harkening back to slavery time. So I, I thought this is a really great illustration of the impact um, of this naturalization act. Um, we also have the passage in 1875 of the Page Act, which is known as the Asian, Asian Im Immigration Act, excuse me, um, which restricted previously unfettered Asian immigration. Uh, and then in the 1880s, a whole host of um, immigration legislation is passed, most notably the Chinese Exclusion Act, right? So particularly in the West Coast, um, California, the Pacific Northwest, mostly in California, um, because the gold rush, they had a ton of uh, Chinese people come over in an agreement of basically open borders with the Chinese government. Uh, and people in California started to complain about that. So that ends up with the Page Act and then um, the Chinese Exclusion Act. Uh, and then same thing, Alien Contract and Labor Acts uh, are also legislating who is allowed to bring workers into the country from foreign nations. We have the 1891 Immigration Act, which does a whole bunch of stuff. Um, it creates the Office of the Superintendent of Immigration, uh, which is under the Treasury Department, uh, which also at the time was in charge of the Coast Guard, right? So anything with borders. And then it creates Ellis Island out of that. So a lot of people don't know that Ellis Island is not in operation until 1892. So it's kind of part of our American um, heritage, our American mythology, right? That if you're an immigrant, your family went through Ellis Island. But if you were an immigrant before 1892, you went through Castle Garden, not Ellis Island. And if you're an immigrant before 1855, you didn't have any real control on your immigration at all. So uh, I thought that was an important point to make because a lot of people don't know that. Maybe you do, hopefully you do, but I thought I would make it anyway. Um, immigration legislation in general is very reactive. It's usually passed in response to an influx of undesirable immigrants, right? Especially during the decades leading up to the 20th century. Um, just have a little typical image, right, of Ellis Island, people kind of being sorted and herded by like cattle, right? This is a very famous image. Um, so a little overview of the progressive era. The turn of the 20th century, which brings the progressive era as the time of economic, political, and social upheaval. So it's really a reaction to the Gilded Age. Um, there's also a series of economic 
depressions that are happening in this time frame. The really big one being the Depression of 1893, which lasts quite a long time. And then we get a couple of um, panics and depressions uh, throughout the, the Progressive Era. Um, the Progressive Era really sought to reform a whole bunch of stuff. Corruption, sanitation, education, nutrition, whole host of other issues affecting ordinary Americans. Uh, so we have Teddy Roosevelt involved in in reform and regulation and trust busting. We have the rise of labor unions and labor unrest. And then we also have the rise of volunteer organizations, particularly women's volunteer organizations, kind of getting involved in the reform efforts. It also sought to define American culture in a whole host of ways, right? Some through white supremacy and manifest destiny, others through rejecting capitalism, um, still others uh, through religion, right? And so if the Gilded Age was kind of represented by like a gluttonous fat cat robber baron, the progressive era was represented by slender, young, white college graduates with their sleeves rolled up, ready to make the world moral again, right? That's the main goal of most of our reform movements during the progressive era. So in the midst of the progressive era, a young Jewish playwright named Israel Zangwell publishes a play called The Melting Pot in 1908. Um, during the tail end of the Teddy Roosevelt presidency, the play follows the life of David Quixano, who is the only member of his family to survive the 1903 Kishinev massacre, which is a pogrom in which Russian Christians targeted Russian Jews. So because he loses his whole family, David wishes for a world without ethnicity and composes a symphony called The Crucible, which is a metaphor for the melting pot and assimilation, right? Uh, in the play, he meets a Russian Christian named Vera and they fall in love only for David to discover that Vera's father took part in the pogrom that killed David's family. So because it's a play, we need a happy ending. Vera's father repents his sins, apologizes. David's symphony is a success and the play ends with David and Vera getting engaged. Um, the play is not the first time the phrase melting pot had been used to describe America's diverse population, but it helped spread the idea as the play was performed to great acclaim. Uh, it first opened in Washington, D.C., and then President Teddy Roosevelt was in attendance on opening night, and he is said to have shouted, that is a great play, Mr. Zangwill. Uh, in 1915, the play was turned into a silent film. So Zangwill's play combined popular ideas about immigration at the time with his own personal experiences as a Jewish refugee. And his desire to erase the concept of ethnicity was not an uncommon one, but in America, there ultimately was no real erasure. There's only assimilation into an existing society. This is a shot from uh, the film, actually, uh, although actor Walter Whiteside, who's second from the right, did play David in the play as well as in the film. And then this is just an uh, advertisement from the Boston Globe from 1918. So the play had legs, right? It kept being performed around the country for many years after it first opened. Um. The United States in the early 1900s is a strange cultural mix, right? We have isolationism tempered with manifest destiny. We have robber barons and socialists, racists and civil rights activists. But a few common threads ran across most of society, which is that white Protestants were the dominant cultural group, um, that Anglo-Saxon culture was American culture, that economic and social stratification was a natural and even desirable part of life, and that America was the most superior country in the world, right? That more morally pure than the corrupt aristocracies of Europe, but also intellectually superior to non-white nations. 
And so this divide is really illustrated by this otherwise innocent Farmist to Stay float from a community in California. I think it's from around 1917. Um, sorry, 1918, because that's when Armist Day is. Uh, it's called the Melting Pot, right? It's the name of the float. And it features a group of children in a variety of national dress. So there's Mexican, Bohemian, Dutch, Japanese. I think the girl in the end is supposed to be Scottish. Um, but there is only one, and it's a little girl in the center in the white dress with the ruffled sleeves and the low sash. Um, only one of them is called the American school girl in the caption. So the other children are not yet considered American because they had not fully assimilated, right? So this next cartoon illustrates these ideas as well. It's a little on the nose, but here we have Manifest Destiny handing a basket of crying foundlings. So we have Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines. And Manifest Destiny is handing the basket to Colombia while Uncle Sam looks on kind of embarrassed, right? And in the original caption, Colombia says, Uncle Sam, gosh, I wish they wouldn't come quite so many in a bunch, but if I've got to take them, I guess I can do as well by them as I've done by the others. So in the background is Texas, New Mexico, California, and Alaska, right? Which were all recent additions as states or territories. Um, so this is this kind of dichotomy in our immigration policy, right? We're expanding our colonial holdings and territories uh, and taking in new people into the world, but not everybody is considered equal, right? So we get more immigration legislation in the progressive era. Uh, the 1903 Immigration Act was also known as the Anarchist Exclusion Act. And it's in a reaction to the 1901 assassination of President William McKinley by an anarchist, right? It targeted foreign born immigrants based on politics. And after World War I, it was used extensively in our post-World War I Red Scare in our fear of Bolsheviks. The Immigration Act of 1917, um, oops, sorry, I had that on there twice. <laughs> it is also known as um, the Asiatic, where am I? The Asiatic, <laughs> excuse me, the Asiatic Bard Zone Act. So that's more kind of anti-immigrant sentiment. Um, passes by Congress by an overwhelming majority, and they actually override President Woodrow Wilson's veto. And the act imposed a literally literacy test, added more categories of people who could be denied entry to the United States, and specifically barred a whole geographic area of the world, which is the Asiatic Bard Zone, which included Eastern Soviet Union, Afghanistan, British India, and pretty much all of South Asia and Southeast Asia. So we have a map of it here. The only areas that are excluded are Japan, um, which the United States had a separate agreement with, the Gentlemen's Agreement, uh, and the Philippines, which was under US control at this point. Um, following the end of the First World War, uh, we have a post-war recession. Um, we have our first Red Scare. We have rising KKK activity. That all kind of coalesces to further restrict immigration with the Emergency Quota Act of 1921, uh, which is the first time a quota system is implemented uh, to stem the tide of immigration specifically from Southern Europe. That was followed by the Immigration Act of 1924, which further excluded Asian immigrants, set stricter quotas on immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe, and created the US Border Control. Border Patrol, excuse me. And according to a 1924 issue in the New York Times, this law resulted in the end of the melting pot, right? So they have comparison of the flow under the Quota Act of 1921 versus the proposed act. And you can see um, how many more countries it's gonna be restricted. And the second map, all the white, solid white countries, they're gonna admit under a thousand immigrants per year and all of the vertical stripe countries, that's 1,000 to 5,000. And the only country under the new law that is allowed to import above 50,000 immigrants 
is Great Britain, right? Which kind of tells you opinions about who was considered valuable to Americans. Um, let's see. So despite these restrictions, thousands of immigrants are already present in the United States. So many of them are working in menial labor and construction, mining and manufacturing. Others are working in home sweatshops. But the goal for thousands was business ownership. Uh, and for many businesses, selling food was a gateway to a better life. So I have this nice Milwaukee lager picture up because Germans had already made a name for themselves in agriculture, brewing, and butchery by the turn of the 20th century. Um, Italians, Eastern Europeans, Chinese, and Jewish people operated push carts um, or peddled goods, everything from shorts and eyeglasses to baked goods and vegetables, like this Chinese peddler in, in California. Um, other people operated delis, coffee counters, green grocers, butchers, and small restaurants. And for people in urban areas housed in slums and tenements, those with kitchen access often found work cheap, cooking cheap street food to people without kitchen access. Um, yeah, sorry, I just went through all that without <laughs> realizing it, excuse me. Um, so for progressive era reformers, right, who are looking to clean up society, immigrants are kind of considered a necessary evil, right? They're needed for a labor force, but for, in, in the opinion of a lot of progressive reformers, they have the wrong ideas about language, food, hygiene, religion, even family and social practices. So much of the handling of immigration centered on quick assimilation, right? The subsuming of immigrant culture, language, and lifestyle to the dominant white Anglo-Saxon Protestant ideal. ideal. Uh, they also sought to impose Protestant work ethic, temperance, sanitation, nutrition, and Christian morals on immigration populations, immigrant populations, and everybody, basically. <laughs> they wanted to do it for everybody, but it was easier to start with immigrants. Um, so we just have some push cards here. Not everybody in the period agreed with these ideas. A lot of people protested them, but they remain kind of the dominant ideas of society to the point that ideas like eugenics, and even forced assimilation of indigenous people through residential schools. Um, like this is an example of a cooking class at the Carlisle Ind Indian School, which is just one of dozens, if not hundreds of residential schools around the country that basically committed uh, cultural genocide against indigenous people. Um, and then also tracking children of color into educational institutions designed to train them only in manual labor and household service were celebrated. So. A lot of these schools did offer opportunity, but limited opportunity. Specific groups were also targeted for various reasons. Uh, the German and Irish in particular were vilified for their beer culture. The progressive era is a time period uh, where society is very interested in temperance and ultimately passes a constitutional amendment banning alcohol, right? And this cartoon illustrates it. Um, it's called a German beer garden in New York City on a Sunday evening. And from a modern perspective, this doesn't look too terrible. But if you think about it from the progressive era perspective, Sunday evening is not a time that you're supposed to be out at a dance hall and you're not supposed to be out with your family and you're not supposed to be serving your children beer, right? Which is exactly what's happening here. So this is a critique of German beer garden culture. Um, Italians, Jews, and Eastern Europeans were vilified for eating garlic, right, and other like spicy foods for drinking alcohol. Also, poor households were targets for criticism of their housekeeping, cooking, sanitation, child rearing, education, and more. And pretty much all households were criticized for buying food from street vendors. Um, and then Catholics and Jews were also targeted for their religious beliefs. Um, some progressive reformers, notably the settlement house movement, sought to assist immigrant communities with education and assistance. Uh, but even the most sympathetic still often had assimilation as an ultimate goal, right? Other groups were much more overt in their disdain and I think had kind of limited results as a limited um, effect as a result because 
Uh, nobody likes to be condescended to, right? So the stew that was American Foodways was also kind of changing dramatically at this point. The progressive era marked a number of important shifts in American life. Uh, for the first time, we get an urban, pop, uh, urban rural population shift. About 1920, the urban population takes over our rural population across the United States. But throughout the progressive era, people are leaving rural areas for urban areas. So that's shifting not only their balance of political power, but also how people ate. Um, we get the development of railroad system, a national railroad system and canning technology at the end of the 19th century meant more and more people had a wider access to a larger diversity of American agricultural products, uh, including canned and fresh produce. And more and more people routinely ate outside the home, especially, like I said earlier, the urban poor who often did not have kitchen facilities in their tenements. Household management was also changing. So the middle class in the Victorian period often had at least one household servant. In the progressive era, it is super hard to find live-in servants, right? Because we have more and more opportunities for wage labor, especially for women. And so people are having to resort to packaged convenience foods to kind of bridge the gap. Um, American food is still kind of loosely established, but a couple of things stand out. Right, so our progressive era and nutrition best practices say that beef, milk and dairy products, white bread and refined white sugar are all part of conventional nutritional wisdom, right? We got our fat, protein and carbohydrates. That's all you need. Oh, and maybe also some vegetables and fruit for fiber. They're mostly water, right? We did not know about vitamins in this time period, although 1912 is when vitamin C is first isolated and identified. Um, most of the rest of our vitamins are not discovered until the 1930s and 40s. So scientists knew that there were some essential elements besides proteins, carbs, and fats that were important to human health, but they didn't not they didn't know what they were or where humans got them from. Um, nutrition scientists were also applying calories to the digestion of food. So they touted traditionally British style food ways that have been popular in America for about a century, right? Are meat and three, uh, because that was easy to calculate the calories of. It was much harder to calculate the calories and nutrition of mixed foods, right? Which factors into a lot of the critiques of immigrant food ways as well. Um, a few 19th century foods were labeled as American, particularly pie, especially pumpkin and apple pie, um, cornbread and biscuits, turkey with cranberry sauce, pancakes with maple syrup, ice cream, baked beans, steak potatoes, bacon, tomato ketchup, American style cheddar cheese. These are all developed separately from European style foods in the 19th century, right? So they're rooted in English culinary traditions, but they're influenced by indigenous American ingredients and African cooking techniques. And then we have a couple of um, Dutch influences, mainly with like waffles, donuts, apple pie cookies, the word cookie comes from the Dutch, and then French influences with like ice cream, white sauce that we put on everything that's bechamel, whipped cream, macaroni and cheese, all that fun stuff. So these are all reflective of the colonial world, primarily in the Northeast and also a little bit the American South um, that are still kind of considered these traditional American foods at this time. So I thought we'd start talking about our individual immigrant groups. And I thought we'd go kind of by chronological order, more or less. So we can start with the Germans, right? There are two main immigrant groups in the early 19th century, the Germans and the Irish. Uh, and the Germans actually have the most influence on American food waste. Um, they're among the earliest Europeans to settle in colonial America, but it really wasn't until the 1820s when large numbers start to come to the United States mostly seeking agricultural lands, which were increasingly scarce in Germany. And by the second half of the 19th century, more and more Germans were emigrating to cities instead of farms, right? So Germans working in food production went on to have a big impact in American food waste. And uh, one of the first and probably least expected one is lager. So I have this great little Schlitz Brewing Company uh, illustration here. So prior to the introduction of German style lager beer, 
most Americans were either drinking hard cider, English style ale, or hard liquor. And Germans with their beer garden culture and their light bubbly beers helped entirely reframe German style beer as an American drink. Nowadays, when you think about American beer, you think of like Budweiser, right? Miller Lite, stuff like that. That's all American style lager. We also in the United States have vast pork and beef supplies. So that really helps develop frankfurters and hamburgers as kind of everyday staple foods. Although largely for festival-like events like fairs, including world's fairs, um, summer beach resorts like Coney Island and increasingly baseball games. And if you know your German history, you know that Hamburg and Frankfurt are two places in Germany and that's where those names come from. Um, sauerkraut, dill pickles, pretzels, those are also part of an increasingly American and not just German life. Soft pretzels in particular were really popular street foods purveyed by pushcart operators and peddlers. And pickle barrels were also common sites in urban areas as street vendors hawked pickles as a snack. Um, so here we have a nice little freight for a merchant, again in New York City, and somebody selling pick, uh, pretzels. But as the progressive era approached, right, as we get to our reform-minded progressives, concerns about food safety and sanitation increased, and many street food vendors of all ethnicities found themselves targeted. Pickles, in particular, were vilified as too harsh on the stomach. Turn of the 20th century, people were obsessed with digestion, right? So spicy mustards are also on the no-go list for that same reason. Uh, and frankfurters and hamburgers, which are made of ground meat. Yes, I can hear. There we go. Um, are subject to increased scrutiny thanks to the likes of books like Upton Sinclair's The Jungle and the Horrors of Meat Packing. The slang word hot dog didn't help matters, as this little cartoon illustrates. So dog and some puppies. And they're saying, I wonder which was father. And it's fresh Frankfurter day at the deli, which is just like, ah. But that was meant to get people to not want to eat hot dogs, right? Um, but if you go to New York City today, a hot dog with spicy brown mustard and sauerkraut, you can get that anywhere. And most people do not associate it with German food, even though it totally is. Germans in World War One. World War I was not a great time for German Americans. Uh, it helped vilify many German food ways. And they did the thing that we did during the Iraq War, right? We renamed uh, sauerkraut became Liberty Cabbage, hamburgers became Liberty Sandwiches, and hot dogs or Frankfurters became Liberty Sausages, although we're also using hot dog already at this point. So that one was less popular. Um, so. The other side effect of World War I is that the anti-German sentiment of the First World War helped a lot of German Americans assimilate more fully, right? It was more shameful to be proud of your German heritage. And so by the end of World War II, most of these German foods are have become American and they're kind of indistinguishable from, from German culture, at least by ordinary Americans. I'm going to talk very briefly about Ireland. Um, although millions of Americans today claim Irish ancestry, the impact of Irish immigration on American food waste has been less than other groups. Uh, most Irish Americans can trace their ancestry to immigrants fleeing the Great Famine of the 1840s, which is probably now it's potato blight decimated food crops for Irish tenant farmers. Um, and the ruling British government basically refused to do anything about the famine. And they continued exporting thousands of pounds of food from Ireland to the UK, uh, even as tens of thousands of Irish people starved and were thrown off of their farms for failing to pay the rent. So over 2 million Irish citizens emigrated to the United States uh, between 1840 and 1855. So anti-Irish sentiment existed in the United States since colonial times. Don't ask George Washington about the Irish. Um, because Ireland was a colony of England for centuries and its primarily Catholic citizens were considered less intelligent and capable than their English overlords. So this sentiment continues throughout the 19th century, but by the 20th century, 
Irish immigrants had largely been assimilated. And because we had new influxes of immigrants from mostly Southern Europe, um, by the time we get to the 20th century, Irish people are largely considered white. And really by the time we get to the mid 20th century, they're no longer othered like they were in the 19th century. So because of colonization, Ireland has a less distinct cuisine than other European nations, right? Because they're colonized by England for so long. But the two that kind of stand out in the United States are Irish soda bread, which is a 19th century invention um, because baking soda was not widely manufactured until the mid 19th century uh, and coal cannon, right? Which is mashed potatoes and cabbage, which I love. If you are thinking about corned beef and cabbage, Right now, you are correct that that is associated with Irish people in America, uh, but corned beef is actually a Jewish invention developed by Jewish immigrants, and then it gets adopted by the Irish. Um, next on our list is Chinese immigrants. So with the discovery of gold in California and the construction of railroads, Chinese immigrants began entering the United States in the 1850s, and they were mostly men. Um, so in 1868, the Burlingame Seward Treaty between the U.S. and China actually allowed free migration of Chinese laborers into the U.S. I mentioned that earlier. But due to a shortage of women in the American West, many Chinese immigrant women ended up working in prostitution. So part of the 1875 Page Act, also known as the Asian Immigration Act, um, purposely forbade the importation of immigrant women for prostitution um, and was concerned that a lot of Chinese laborers are being, being imported against their will. So it also forbade involuntary immigration from Asian countries. So because you couldn't tell who was being imported for prostitution and who was coming to like join their husbands, um, that basically banned Asian women from entering the United States. And this creates kind of bachelor communities among Chinese and other Asian immigrants. Uh, and then in 1882, in reaction to increasing racism against Asians in the West, the Chinese Exclusion Act actually halted all Chinese immigration for a period of 10 years. It was the first American law to restrict immigration based on nationality alone. And after several extensions, it was finally extended indefinitely. It was not repealed until 1943. So the Chinese Exclusion Act severely restricted economic opportunities for Chinese immigrants already in the country. But in 1915, the types of work allowed were expanded to include restaurants. So this leads to a huge boom in Chinese restaurants in the United States. Previously, Chinese restaurants had been run primarily from then from Sichuan province, who were pretty much catering to American palates. They're not professional chefs, right? But as Chinese food became more popular outside of Chinese communities, the number of chop suey and lo mein houses expanded dramatically. So by the 1920s and 30s, visits to Chinatown, whether it's in New York, Chicago, or San Francisco, um, and Chinese restaurants becomes popular among middle and upper class white Americans. Um, American Chinese food, like many immigrant cuisines, was created by Chinese immigrants based on American ingredients and also tastes. So restaurants had to cater to their clientele and Chinese restaurants often focused on meat, noodle and rice dishes and far less on vegetable seafood and offal that may have been more common at home, right? So Chinese immigrant foodways, like I said earlier, they reflect the training of their cooks, which was not formally trained. Um, formal Chinese cooking is very complicated and that's not the style of cooking that Chinese immigrants were doing here in the United States. Um, although most Chinese food in America is reflective of this adaptive style of cooking, a few recipes, very few recipes have come to be considered American. Uh, one exception is chop suey, which that name gets attached to American foods that are rarely connected to Chinese cooking, right? If you are from the Northeast, chops you might call something like chili mac or goulash chop suey, right? So it's so not necessarily connected, um, but other foods like sweet and sour chicken, general sauce chicken, things like that were invented specifically for American tastes. 
And so by the time we get to the mid 20th century, the popularity of these Chinese restaurants mean that ingredients like soy sauce and chow mein noodles are available in grocery stores and they end up making their way um, into a variety of dishes invented by non-Chinese Americans, right? So here we have some examples. This is um, a chop suey house in Chicago from 1907. You can tell that the clientele is probably designed to be very wealthy. It's very, it's leaning in very heavily on the chinoiserie. Uh, this is a still from a film, 1922 silent film called Chop Suey. And this is the uh, actress Dorothy DeVore wearing yellow face, basically. That was very popular um, in 1920s and 30s filming. And then this is probably from around 1930. This is a postcard for Lee's Chop Suey Restaurant in, in uh, New Hampshire. All right, so Jewish and Eastern European immigration, um, the Progressive Era saw a greater influx of immigrants from places like Southern Italy, Eastern Europe, especially Ashkenazi Jews, Russia, Greece, and the Middle East. Although they're Caucasian, these groups were considered undesirable and were not at the time considered fully white like Northern Europeans. So Jews had been present in the United States from the early colonial time, um, dating back to the 17th century, but Jews in Russia, Poland, and other Eastern European countries began emigrating the U.S. in much larger numbers in the 1870s to escape pogroms and other persecution. Um, and then following the 1905 Russian Revolution and the rise of the Soviet Union in 1917, more Eastern Europeans fled to America, either escaping religious or political persecution or seeking economic opportunity. And the Russian artificial famine of is um, called the Holodomor in Ukraine uh, led to more immigration. Because of religious restrictions on their food, um, Ashkenazi Jewish immigrants were often butchers and owned delis and dairy bars. So dairy bars is a place where you do not have meat, so Jewish people can eat dairy and still keep kosher. Uh, and Jewish delis are responsible for a number of foods that most Americans do not often associate with Judaism, including corned beef and pastrami, especially on Jewish style rye bread, chopped liver, bagels and bialis, uh, and blintzes. Uh, although many of these foods are more broadly associated with deli culture in the Northeast, just about any diner in America can get you a Reuben sandwich or corned beef and hash. And bagels in particular have become especially American. They're almost completely divorced from their Jewish origins, uh, at least outside of New York. Uh, other European immigrants produce food like Borscht from Ukraine, blini from Russia, pierogies and kielbasa from Poland, goulash from Hungary, and more. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because we're running out of time. <laughs> um, Greek food waves, briefly. Greek War of Independence began in the 1820s. That's when we start to get Greek immigration. Um, picks up again in the 1890s. Um, we have a pogrom in 1909 in Omaha, Nebraska largely because a lot of the bulk of Jew of Greek immigrants were men, as many of ni as 90%, which is much higher than other immigrant communities. Um, and so especially post-World War I, um, pretty much Greek people realize they can't, Greek men realize they can't go back, right? Largely because of um, there's a genocide against both Greeks and Armenians and Assyrians by the Ottoman Empire post-World War I, which means a lot of people can't go home. So Greek immigrants in the 20th century often worked in restaurants, especially diners. They introduced a whole bunch of yummy things, right, to us, um, especially Coney Island hot dogs, Cincinnati chili. Those are true Greek American food ways. And like other Southern Europeans, they're targeted by quota legislation. Our Italian food ways, um, Italians are a little bit later than some of our other immigrant groups. They're really starting to come in the 1880s, especially from Southern Italy and primarily Naples. So Naples had been part of the Spanish empire in the 16th century and one of, one of the first European nations to adopt tomatoes, right? Which are indigenous to Central America and Mexico. Um, many Neapolitans were facing abject poverty in rural Naples and coming to the United States afforded them more access to foods like meat and white flour 
which were prohibitively expensive back home. So like Chinese immigrants, Italian immigrant foodways were very strongly shaped by American ingredients. So for instance, spaghetti and meatballs, which is considered in the US to be quintessentially Italian, is in fact Italian American. Meatballs and spaghetti are both eaten in Italy, but rarely together, right? Pasta had been adopted by Americans as early as the late 18th century, thanks to like Thomas Jefferson, but it was almost always eaten with a cream sauce or with cheese. Italian immigrants from Naples introduced the concept of pasta with tomato sauce, as well as tomato paste. Um, they bring vegetables that are unfamiliar, but they're familiar to us now, including broccoli, eggplant, artichoke, olives, and capers. We have this olive cellar here in our illustration. And then also cured meats like pepperoni and salami. And perhaps most importantly for pizza lovers, Neapolitans introduced Americans to their style of pizza, which included tomato sauce. The first pizza restaurant in the U.S. opened in New York in 1905, Lombardi's in Little Italy. Many Italian immigrants worked in food industries and street food purveyors sold bread, vegetables, and fruit, as well as quick meals like pizza. But during the progressive era, concerns about sanitation led to a crackdown on street vending. And even pasta production in Italy was considered suspect, right? Um, the popularity of pasta in the 20th century as an inexpensive and filling food really led to the creation of pasta manufacturing in the United States. All right, we're out of the progressive era now, but I got to talk about the Great Depression, right? Because it has kind of a bigger impact on American food than you might think. Um, stock market crash of 29, overnight people who had been comfortable were suddenly penniless. And farmers who were used to supplementing their not very big cash in incomes with, with like vegetable gardens, chickens, milch cow or whatever, found their farms turn into dust. Right, so nearly everybody was looking for ways to save money and food, as today, was one of the easiest budget lines to cut. So ground beef, which was previously a way to use up the offcuts of meat, suddenly became a hot commodity because that was just about the only meat that most people could afford. And so it's hard to make, you know, like a meat and three with ground beef, unless you do hamburger, which some people did. Um, so a lot of white Americans turn to their immigrant neighbors for inspiration. So you get spaghetti with meat sauce, moussaka, goulash, chili, tamale pie, chop suey, all gained popularity during the 1930s. Um, and then previously, casserole stews and soups have been frowned upon by home economists and nutrition scientists because they're difficult to calculate the nutrition value. All of a sudden now they're touted as a frugal way to feed the family. So white Americans are learning these immigrant food ways to cope with the Great Depression. Um, some of them are pretty close to how immigrant communities were eating their foods. A lot of them were Americanized, meaning like no spices, <laughs> they're very bland, right? To make them more palatable. Um, so just some examples of uh, the Great Depression. So, Becoming American, right? Most of the immigrants groups we've discussed today are at the core of those immigrating in the lead up to and during the progressive era. But for many Americans, those foodways remain fairly exotic and foreign, right? There's a fear of garlic until the late 20th century. It really isn't until after the Second World War that GI is returning from abroad and bringing food experiences in Europe and the Pacific bring home acceptance of a lot of these food ways. The 1950s are when many of the foods we consider American today become popularized. Um, you know, like hot dogs and hamburgers and, and street foods, pizza and pasta, those all kind of become foods that are made at home. And then also European peasant food has kind of a revival in the post-war period. So like things like Hungarian goulash and Greek lamb stew, right? The, those start popping up at dinner parties instead of you know, like pot roasts and stuff. Um, immigrants themselves became American too, right? The Second World War, it's illustrated by this nice little propaganda poster, reacted to Nazism and the Holocaust by emphasizing the importance of America's diversity as a strength. The government framed anti-immigrant sentiment as anti-American sentiment. Irish, Greek, German, Italian, Eastern European, and even Jewish immigrants were increasingly seen as white Americans, especially if they assimilated 
but Asian, African-American, and indigenous citizens still faced racism, as did more recent immigrants who had not yet assimilated. The Braceros labor exchange program and an influx of Caribbean and South American immigrants mid-century led to increased racism toward people lumped together under Mexican and Negro labels. So is America still a melting pot? Uh, we've struggled with cultural, religious, and racial diversity since our founding. During the Second World War, a common enemy brought nations together, as this cartoon illustrates. But after the war, Russia and China diverged in goals from the United States and the UK. And these divisions are still in place today. Um, this cartoon illustrates the struggles of Europe post-war to reconcile with nationalism and Nazi Germany. Again, issues it still faces today. And this little bit later cartoon from the 1980s, right, illustrates the challenges of a diverse populace that resists assimilation and conformity. So we still struggle with diverse groups today. Who is a real American, right? Should English be our national language? How should we deal with immigration? These are all questions that we're still talking about over 200 years since our first immigration laws were passed. So one thing that has changed since the past is the increased acceptance of immigrant foodways into ordinary American households. They're not always considered American, um, but it's far more common to find cuisines from around the world on American plates. Food is what connects us, right? It's often the last thing that assimilated immigrants want to give up, and it connects us to our roots, our culture, and even our religion. So, right on the dot, I always end my talks with a question. Well, thank you so much. Uh, if people do need to leave, um, you can go ahead and do that, and I promise I won't judge. Um, but I know some people have questions. If you'd like to stay and have your questions answered, um, please feel free to do that. Um, so Adrian asked the first question. I'm I know sorry, it went so long. It's the first time I've done this talk, so <laughs> that's okay. It was great. There are a lot of primary sources I have never seen before, so that was really yeah. great food for thought. Um, okay, so we talked about the progressive era being focused on assimilation, but how were foods related to traditions reconciled in those communities that were seeking assimilation? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, Food is like the last thing to go, right? Uh, for a lot of immigrant communities, even those that are interested in assimilation, um, food is the last thing they're holding on to. They might only make it at holidays or for special occasions. Um, but even today, there are like third, fourth, fifth generation, like Italian immigrants who they still make a pot of Sunday gravy, right? Or like my family, I'm Scandinavian, I'm a fourth and fifth generation Scandinavian immigrant. So we still make Scandinavian style Christmas cookies and like rice pudding at Christmas time. So um, yeah, I think food is that one last connection that people want to hold on to. Language goes, you know, um, cult other cultural practices go, music, dancing, art, all that stuff goes, but food is usually the last thing to hold on. So yeah. All right, fantastic. Then Richard asks, how did the diversity of the melting pot of food influence the evolution of sea rations during the World Wars and beyond? Oh, C as in the letter C or C as in S-E-A? The letter C. <laughs> that is a great question, and I don't know that I'm going to be able to answer it super accurately, but I will tell you that what I know about World War II is it has a kind of a homogenizing effect on American foodways, and it's kind of the death of regional foodways in a lot of ways, because you get people from all over the country coming together and eating the same style of food. So I usually use the, the metaphor of um, Thanksgiving. Like Thanksgiving is when a lot of like traditional American foods are consumed, but there's still some regional differences. And so when you're in the military, guess what? You got the New England style of Thanksgiving because that was the dominant culture in you know the people who are nutrition scientists and controlling what what people are eating. So um, the military also, like I said, does expose GIs to foreign foods, but I don't know that much about the sea rations themselves if they were were reflecting 
the the tastes of the troops. I think not really. I think they were more concerned with with new, the conventional nutrition wisdom of the time. But that is a great question, and now something that I want to look more into. <laughs> we're gonna check on your blog to see if we find our answer. Oh gosh, <laughs> I go down the rabbit hole so much. Yeah. Great. Uh, quick question from Brooke. Uh, she has a burger related question. Have you ever had Carol Weidman's chocolate covered potato chips? Did I say that correct? <laughs> yes. Yes. Chippers. Chocolate chippers. Yep. That is a Fargo, North Dakota specialty and they are delicious chocolate covered potato chips. Could you have a more American <laughs> Yeah, we didn't eat them super a lot when I grew up because they were kind of expensive and my family was not particularly wealthy, but I have had them and they are delicious. Fantastic. Well, Brooke, save some for me. I want to try this for sure. And then Kelly asked, were Chinese recipes simplified because there weren't many women of Chinese descent allowed in the U.S. Um, and adapting to U.S. taste? And it says, I imagine that most places women did much of the cooking at that time and that young men might not have done cooking prior to coming in the United States. That is a really great question. Um, I don't have hard evidence, but my assumption is that that is the case because I have run across stuff about um, a lot of Chinese cooks not being cooks in China. And so they're having to become cooks when they come to the United States. I think a lot of it, though, really is um, a lack of ingredients because a lot of Chinese cooking is kind of complicated, right? It, it has a lot of sauces and a lot of, of things that are not typically available in the United States. But I think that's one of the reasons why it is simplified. Um, but also they're, when they're opening restaurants, they're catering to white American palates. Um, so it's like things like Peking duck and suey and lo mein and, you know, kind of stir fry things that are not typically part of classical Chinese cooking, right? They're adapting to right. what's available in the U.S. Fantastic. Um, one more question from Daniel. Um, did you encounter primary sources on how they viewed Tex-Mex in the Southern region as culturally unfit for human consumption? Great question. You know, I have to tell you, I almost put an entire section on Mexican Americans. And then I was like, this is already too long. So <laughs> I didn't, but yeah, that is a huge impact. And I see somebody else in the comments in the chat asked about African American food ways um, because this is specifically focused on immigrant communities in the progressive era. It did not talk about those two groups, um, but yeah, Tex-Mex and, you know, Spanish, aka indigenous Mexican foodways um, had a big influence on 20th century American foodways in particular, um, and also African-American foodways have a huge influence on um, American food more generally. Uh, so yeah, they're, they were not in the talk, but they do have a big influence. I think we're going to have to bring Sarah back to do a whole talk on that because I feel like that is a topic for itself. Like we could talk about that for hours as well. So that is a great suggestion. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, well, thank you everyone for being here tonight. Thank you to those of you who stayed a little bit extra. I was really locked into this one. Um, if you are members of our grants, Edge, Acre, um, Epic, what did I forget? Lead. Um, Sarah has shared some resources and we'll be uploading those to the Canvas course for you um, to look at. So thank you again and have a great night, everyone. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Good night.